Okay, <clears throat> so today is our Focus on Theology Sunday. We're going to look at the inner man. Now, I have a handout for you this morning, and <clears throat> pass that around. <clears throat> So what I, I'm going to try to make this as informal as we as I can. Um, and I, 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 I'm, and anyways, <laughs> I got tongue tied there. <clears throat> so if you have any questions, uh, interrupt and, and ask them. We we want to go through making sure that you understand <clears throat> what what's going on. <clears throat> So there's four slides there on this on this the handout. We're gonna <clears throat> those same slides will be repeated on the uh, <clears throat> the PowerPoint. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> I still find that song a little low for me, Jeremy. For, I know <laughs> it's just the the, the first very one. first line and the end last line. <clears throat> I don't know why it is, but I think as we get older, our range is that what it is? Are you saying I'm old? Well, yeah. I know that my range is a lot older. Can you sing it up the octave, or is that too high? That's too high. Yeah. Is it too high? It's our range. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, what we're trying to do is we're trying we're trying to fit this into our study of Galatians chapter five again about walking by the Spirit, following the the, the Spirit, and how do we do that? And it talks there in chapter 5, 16 to the end about the, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the spirit and all those things. How does this all work? Well, when it comes to, to, to the makeup of man, of you and I, the, the Bible gives us a very good description, although there's not really one chapter or place that we can go. So it's like a systematic theology in order to, uh, to come up with a conclusion as to the, the theology of the inner man. You've got you to gotta grab stuff from all over. Now it's really important that when you do that, you make sure that, that those verses that you're grabbing, um, you understand its message by its context. So theology just isn't picking and choosing verses that fit with what you hope it means or think it means, but you've got to make sure that uh, we're presenting what the Bible teaches. Now, I, I, when I did this study several years ago, I, I, like I said earlier, it made the, made the Bible come alive in a lot of things. I mean, the doctrines of grace opened the scriptures up, and it was a thrill to me when I came to understand those. Uh, it made the scriptures so thr thrilling and clear. And, and then when I when I changed my my presuppositions from uh, from dispensationalism to no covenant theology, and it just like again, it just it's like all oh, it all of a sudden it makes sense. It cleared away all the cobwebs. And the dark corners that dispensationalism uh, gave me, and <clears throat> and this is another one of those those things. It just helps me to to make the Bible a whole lot clearer. So it, it's really essential to understand. And as we go through it, you're going to see why there's why we need clarity because uh, the Bible uses a whole bunch of different words to refer to different things. Now, in in uh, in in Romans six that we read in our scripture reading, it, it talks about. Uh, the are instruments, okay, and so it's talking about different parts of man. So make make sure your instruments are are for righteousness and not for sin. So instruments, of course, is plural. So what's he talking about there? What's what is involved in this? So the, the thing that we discover when we're reading the Bible is that there are many words that describe, particularly, the spiritual aspect of mankind. So we have the soul, we have the spirit. Uh, we have the nature, we have body, we have the inner inner man, the outer man, we have the mind, the conscience, the instruments, uh, the flesh, a whole bunch of different words that are used sometimes interchangeably with one another and other times to refer to a very distinct part of us. So the question comes down then, how many parts do we actually have? What is the actual makeup of man and specifically the inner man? So the first thing I want you to, to understand is the Bible agrees that there is a spiritual 
and a uh, or Im immaterial part of man and a physical or material part of man. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 16. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Okay, so there that verse is talking about two parts of man. There's the outer self or the outer man and the inner self or the inner man. Now before I go any further, I just want to do something here. This is going to be the first time that I actually do this. And we'll see how it works. So here's one of the neat things that, that my new computer allows me to do. So, so we have the outer self. Watch this. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> and the inner self. And I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time doing this. But uh, I just it's so cool, cool that it, it does that. So the, the outer self and inner self. It, so it identifies there's really two parts to man. An outer man and an inner man. Um, so now turn over to Romans chapter 7, verse 22. Romans chapter 7, verse 22. For I delight in the law of God, where? In my inner being. In my inner being. Okay, in my inner being. So there is a, an inner being that is, has the capability of delighting in God. And in particular, the law in here, not the, the, um, the written code, but the law of God in terms of, of his righteousness. Okay, that we have an ability, that inner being has an ability to be able to delight in God. Now, and Ephesians 3.16. Ephesians 3.16. According to the riches of his glory, this is God, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit, where? Your inner being. In your inner being. So there that is again. But the inner being then, then not only does it have the ability to, um, to delight in God, uh, but it also needs to be strengthened. It needs to be strengthened. And, and part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to strengthen us in our inner being. And what that means, we'll find out later on. So there, there is a, an outer part and there is an inner part um, <clears throat> that we have. So er everyone agrees, all the theologians agree, that the outer self is, is what would be what? Our body. Our bodies, right? So the, the outer part, the outer man, the outer self is called the body. Um, they don't agree on all of the description of the inner man and whether there's only one part or whether there's two parts. Ever heard the words dichotomy and trichotomy? You heard those? Okay. The, 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 um, I, I graduated with a Bachelor of Theology from the Alliance College. And, and I don't want to despair the college, but when I look back at it, I was no more a theologian than, than anything when I came out of that college because it taught me that those were the only two options, either trichotomy or dichotomy. It didn't teach me. All of the rest of the group didn't teach what the Bible actually teaches about the makeup of man. And I was really disappointed. And that, that led to a lot of, a lot of misunderstanding and, and confusion and a lot of, of stress when I was studying the Bible because I didn't understand it right. Because I had this conclusion that there was only, it was either a trichotomy or a dichotomy. And so and when I read all these words, I, I, it just drove me nuts. All right, so 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I don't have it written there, but you can put it on your sheet there. First, uh, let's take a look at that because it's, uh, it's really an important verse about this. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there it says spirit and soul and body and so it identifies these three parts so what we've, we've discovered now is that there's really only two parts the outer self and the inner self but it seems to be describing the inner self as being the soul and the spirit <coughs> at least there's two aspects to it so are they two are they 
two separate things and so we really have three parts or is it an outer and an inner part and the inner part has a spirit and a soul so that is what we're going to figure out next now most agree again that the body that we have a body and a soul and, and the, one of the reasons why they come to that conclusion is that the immaterial part that lives, it, it lives after the body dies. We believe in eternal life, and when the body dies, there's a, a, the immaterial, this part uh, goes on to live. And there seems to be that the most um, descriptive word from the scriptures for that is the word soul. So uh, l listen to this one, Psalm 31, verse 9. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. So there the psalmist talks about the soul and the body. Uh, Micah 6 and 7. Wait, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Right? So there Micah is saying, do I give my, my son who was born from, by my flesh, my body, uh, or, or do I give him, am I giving him as the fruit of my soul? Uh, is he the sinfulness of my soul? So again, body and soul. And in the New Testament, Matthew 10, 28, Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So again, a specific reference to the part that lives on is called the soul. But the scriptures also talk about the body and the spirit. So look at Romans 8, verse 10. Romans 8, verse 10. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. So there it's, Paul is identifying the body and the spirit. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 34. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 7, verse 34. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about what she anxious about, how to be holy in body and spirit. Right? So she recognizes that we have a physical aspect. They, they want to be holy in that. And they don't want to commit adultery. They don't want to commit sexual sins. Um, and and how, do we, how do I be holy in my spirit as well in, in terms of my relationship with God? So body and spirit. And then James, James chapter 2, verse 26. Uh, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So again, James identifies that there is the body and the spirit. So we've had that we have we see a number of verses then that talk about the body and the soul and a number of verses that talk about the body and the spirit. So are, are the soul and the spirit interchangeable? Is it the same thing or are they two different aspects? Well, we need to go on because it gets more confusing here. Because the the scriptures not only talks about the body and the soul and the body and the spirit, but guess what? It also talks about the body and the heart. So look at Ecclesiastes 11.10 Ecclesiastes 11.10 So the preacher says Remove vexation from my heart and put away pain from your body for youth and the dawn of life is vanity. All right, Vexation from my heart so that's the spiritual part of it and, vex and pain from the body in the physical part. And he's praying, please remove it. Okay, I've got this anxieties that I have. So heart and body. Colossians 3.15. Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Now, the body there can refer to the physical body, or it can refer to the body of Christ, um, or it can refer to the whole body, meaning the immaterial and material parts connected together. But we still have this connection then. So there's the heart specifically and the body in reference. So which is it? Do we, is it really a, a, a quaternomy? Is that a word? Quat? Quat, what's four in French? 
cat. It's a cat on me. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so we're not made up of three parts. We're made up of four. A body, a, a soul, a spirit, and a heart. There we go. So how, how does it all fit together uh, in terms of, of understanding the scriptures? I mean, we can start getting really confused on, on this. The thing that is not um, unclear is the fact that we have an outer self, okay, an outer self, and an inner self. Wasn't that fun? <laughs> I thought that was fun. An outer self and an inner self. Okay, I'm going to refer to it as a, the outer man and the inner man. Um, so the problems then center around what the inner man is actually called. Because that's where it is. Is the inner man the soul? Or is the inner man the spirit? Or is it the inner man the heart? Or is the inner man all three of those things? Um, and we'll, we'll figure that out as we go along. All right, so the, the outer man we definitely know is the uh, material part of mankind, of our bodies. And it makes up the physical part. So let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, oh, oh yeah, I forgot. When I have that on, I have to use my down arrows. Okay, so, so here, here we have a, a diagram of the, of the physical body. Now, in the scriptures, the physical body is referred to as the body. That makes sense, right? Or it's referred to, the, what's the other word that can be used? The flesh, okay? So John 1, 14, the word became flesh, right? So now it's talking about he not only became human, but he, he became human in his flesh. But more than just his flesh, he also took on the immaterial, the spiritual part of the man. So he's a whole man uh, in, in, in totality. That's usually when you're talking about the flesh, it's me referring not just to the physical, but also to the spiritual part of man. In Mark 6, 29, uh, after Jesus was died on the cross, the disciples came and they, they took his body and laid it in the tomb. That's pretty clear. So the body is made up of skin and hair, uh, eyes and ears, a skeleton system, a nervous system, a vascular system, a muscular system. It's all the fluids of blood and water. It's all of the different organs, the heart, the brain, the lungs, the pancreas, and uh, the thymus. I don't have one of those anymore. And uh, uh, lungs and all those kinds of things. It's also made up of the cells. And what do cells have? Electrons, amino acids, proteins, uh, DNA, all, all those things. That's all the physical aspect. It's the parts that you can actually see either with your naked eye or under a microscope. They're there. It's material. Uh, it's the, the things that did not exist prior to creation. And when God created, he created all of these things to be able to come together and make a man. And of course then, because we are physical, we have a lot of, of biological needs. Right? So we have, we have a need for shelter. We have a need for clothes, which comes from our need for warmth. Right? And we have a need to sleep. Um, we have a need for exercise. And, and, uh, um, and these create a number of physical, or biological and physical desires, don't they? What are some of the physical desires that we would have? Okay, food. We, we, we have a desire for food, okay? okay? That's why Mary Ave is munching there right now. And, and, uh, okay? And, and why when I'm preaching you, you get really hungry? So something about me preaching that makes you hungry? See, time. That's a time. desire. Day. Day. Yeah, well it creates that desire. That's a physical desire. right? And then we're going to see how, how that desire works into, well, do I eat or don't I eat? Do I actually grab that piece of apple or do I, not, do, I do it discreetly? So Pastor Cliff doesn't see it. And, and, you know, all those different kinds of things. And which kind of food you eat, that's all part of it. So we're, we're going to get to see how that, that works. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because here we have a great description in chapter 15 of the, of the uh, physical body and, and uh, what, how God describes it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42 to 44. Okay, verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable is raised imperishable. Verse 43. It is sown in dishonor. So when it's talking about sown, it's talking about being born. Uh, is born in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is born in weakness. 
it's raised in power, it's born in natural body, and it's raised a spiritual body. Is there, if there is a natural body, there's a spiritual body. Then in verse 54, it talks about, uh, about being a mortal body. Right? So we have perishable, and the word perishable means that it's aging and it can get sick. Okay? Dishonor means that it actually bears the results of the sin curse, which is what? The main result of the sin curse is? Death. Death, right? So, so not only do we age and get sick, but we actually die. And weakness means that we can get tired, we get fatigued. Uh, and, uh, and natural is uh, opposite to, um, to a glorified body, and mortal means that it doesn't live forever. And again, that's the opposite to our glorified body, our spiritual body, where we will live forever. So that's the, that's the physical body. So man is made up of a physical part and a spiritual part. The physical part is referred to as the outer self, and the spiritual part is the inner self, or the outer man and the inner man. All right, so let, let's go, let's just, oh yeah, I'm used to that. So then we have the, the inner man. So I'm just going to describe it here as, as a heart, or de, not describe it, diagram it as a heart at the beginning here. So the inner man is the immaterial or the spiritual part of man. Now here's where we've got to understand something. The inner man is interchangeable, interchangeably called the soul, the spirit, the heart. So those three words really are often, most often are refer, referring to the whole inner man, however it's made up. And um, as either the soul, the spirit, or the heart. And what you, we're going to discover, hopefully I'll be able to show it to you, is that the word soul is the main word that describes it. So more often than not, when the, the Bible talks about the soul, it's talking just about that immaterial spiritual part of man as the soul. And, and we're going to see that the spirit, although it refers to the whole time, actually most often is referred to a specific part of the inner man or the soul. And the same with the heart, that it refers to a specific part more often. So, but they, so in that way, not only is it interchangeably called the spirit, the soul, and the heart, but those words are used distinctly to refer to different parts of the, the soul or the inner man. Uh, <clears throat> so again, the Bible uses words like the conscience, the flesh, the mind, the will, the nature. These are all distinct parts of the inner man. Uh, Ephesians 2.3 says that the flesh passionately carries out the desires of the body. Okay, the flesh, we're going to look at that in a little more detail. But So again, it's just talking about a specific part of the inner man. So let's take a look at these, these, uh, these words. So Job chapter 7, verse 11. Job 7, verse 11. Job says, Therefore I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Now, this is Hebrew poetry. So these two lines are actually parallel which means that spirit and soul are being used interchangeably to refer to the inner man, the spiritual part of man as opposed to the physical part. Uh, Isaiah 26, 9. Isaiah 26, 9. My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. Again, that's uh, Hebrew poetry, and it's, it's a parallel lines. So the soul and the spirit, again, are used interchangeably to refer to the inner man. Uh, and 1 Thessalonians 5.23, though, uh, is talking about very distinct. We already read this verse. Okay? Uh, May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus. So now he's talking about three distinct things. Uh, the soul, the spirit, and the body. And in this sense, what we're going to discover is that the soul is actually referring to the nature of man. The spirit is referring to the inner spirit uh, of man, or the, his, where his desires for God are. And, uh, and his body, of course, is the outward 
outer man, um, his physical part. All right, Psalm 51, verse 10. Psalm of David's Psalm of Repentance. Create in me a clean what? A clean heart. We know that verse because we sing the song that was written to go along with it. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit, spirit within me. So there, uh, heart and spirit are used interchangeably. Uh, Ezekiel 11, 9. Uh, in Ezekiel 11, 9, I will give them one heart. And here, this is the, the prophetic passage about the coming of the new covenant. And uh, God says, I will give them all, not a new heart here, I'm sorry, one heart. And here he's talking about one desire for God. I'm going to give them all one common desire for God. And a new spirit I will put within them. I'm going to remove the heart of stone. Okay, that's our human nature. Uh, and from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh or another new nature. So now he's talking about distinct things. So the, the one heart referring to the whole inner man that we all have one desire for God to as one aspect of it, but very distinctly a heart of stone and a heart of flesh that uh, are the nature to remove one nature and give us a new nature. And this is really important to understand because oftentimes you'll hear, you, I hear preach, I even, I hear um, um, doctors of grace preachers mess this up all the time because they always talk about our, our sin nature still being in us. We don't have a sin nature anymore. The sin nature was removed. Okay? We do have sin that still exists within us, but it's not in the nature. And we need to, under, we'll understand the nature of nature when we get there. But we need to understand that in the new covenant, that uh, through faith in Christ, through our justification, he took out the sinful nature and put in a new nature, uh, which is described as the nature of flesh, in that it responds to God and it desires God. This is what, how it all connects. All right, um, uh, Daniel 5.20. Daniel 5.20, where he's, uh, Daniel here is talking about Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, when his heart, when Nebuchadnezzar's heart was lifted up and his spirit was so hardened uh, hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. So uh, again we have, um, we have his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened. And, and in this text it's referring to two distinct different parts. There's a part that was called the heart and, and uh, it was lifted up with pride and his spirit um, desired pride, desired self, um, self uh, fulfillment, uh, and um, and then in his mind he actually acted proudly, and, and so we have those distinct parts. All right, let's quickly move on here. Uh, Deuteronomy six five, uh, Deuteronomy six five, the Shema, uh, the most important verse of uh, of Jewish people even today. Uh, it was quoted by Jesus in the Gospels. Okay, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. Okay, heart and soul. All right, so now we have that that other combination again: heart and and souls. Or is this are these is it referring to distinct parts, or is it talking about parallel parts, referring to the same thing? Uh, Psalm eighty four two. Uh, Psalm 84, 2. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the, the living God. So again, my soul referring to that inner man, and my heart in parallel poetry, the inner man, so soul and heart are the same thing there. And my flesh, my body, uh, it uh, longs for the joy of loving God. And a New Testament verse, 1 Peter 1.22, 1 Peter 1.22, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So the action of love comes from having a pure heart. How do we get that pure heart? Well, that's one of the other things we're going to discover how it all works together, how the process works. But there, having purified your souls, right, and, and that that I think is referring to the whole inner man, 
Um, but the love comes from a pure heart, and I think it makes heart there distinct uh, from the soul. There could be an argument that it's interchangeable. Uh, at this point, it doesn't really matter. And <clears throat> All right, so, so we got uh, spirit and soul, we got spirit and heart, we got soul and heart, and then of course we have uh, uh, soul, heart, and spirit uh, that, that we can put it all together. So the Bible seems to identify that uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the inner man uh, is, is the soul, that would be the main word that describes it, the soul, <clears throat> and it is made up of five parts, the nature, the spirit, the flesh, the mind, and the will. These are all five, the five parts. So we're going to go through each of those to to see how they they work. So again, um, now just just a little bit of a, an aside here, something that comes out of this. Uh, theologians talk about um, something known as conditional unity. Have you heard that word before? Conditional unity. Conditional unity. Uh, means that there is an essential unity between the material part of man and the spiritual part. So between the body and the soul. It, that has an essential unity. The soul is incomplete without the body. And the body is incomplete without the soul. In other words, we would, we would not say that a person has... A, a, um, we would not say that a person has a body and a soul. We would say we have a, a, a that we are a body and soul. See the difference? We don't have a body and soul as though they're distinct and separate, but we are a body and soul. We are inter um, essentially united. Okay, so the Bible presents us as unified. So in other, in other words, we, we sin as a whole. So when we, we sin in our thoughts or in our actions, we, we, uh, we're, we are making the whole person sinful. And uh, that makes sense because when we're judged by God, we're actually judged as a whole person as well. And of course that means that when we die uh, and our body and souls are separated, uh, our soul exists without a body, right? Okay, and we call that, what state do we call that? The intermediate state, all right, and uh, and it's an unnatural separation, in which dead people, who are just a soul, they're longing for the day in which they can be reunited to their bodies. Uh, it's an essential part of unity. This is why the uh, day of resurrection is so important to us, because the end result of the day of resurrection is that our those that have already died in Christ, their souls are reunited to their bodies, and those of us who are living and now are taken into heaven are given a sinless body, so that, so that all of us can be whole human beings in heaven. All right, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 4. Extremely important verse in regards to this. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 4. For while we are still in this Tent. So we're referring to the human body. Okay, we groan, being burdened. Okay, while we're on this earth, we're groaning because sin is evident in our bodies, in our weakness, in our tiredness, in our in our sickness, in our aging, and all those different things, in our spreading out, and <laughs> all those different things. We groan about those things, right? And not that we would be unclothed, that is not that we would get rid of our bodies, but that we would rather, we would, we would be further clothed. In other words, we would be clothed with glorified bodies. That's our goal and our desire right now. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. In other words, eternal life. In other words, we need a body, but what we long for is a body without sin. And the implications of that is that, to the doctrine of salvation, is that when men fell in sin, he fell as a, as a whole person. And when he's redeemed, he's redeemed as a whole person. Romans 8 talking about the redemption of the physical. And, and, uh, and not in addition to the, the physical world, but also the physical body. That's, that's part of our struggle right now, is we haven't got rid of all of the effects of the, 
of the uh, curse of sin. Even though we're redeemed, even though we're justified, okay, we, we still have the effects somehow in our body. Um, we have fallen bodies, and we long to be without sin, and if we die and enter into the immediate, intermediate state with the Lord, uh, with, we're without a body, but still we, we long to have a sinless body. All right, so now, um, another question that comes out of that, and I'm not, not going to go into a lot of detail here, but I'll just mention it briefly. Creationism is, uh, is a, teaches that God creates a new soul for each person. And he puts that into the person's body sometime between conception and birth. Okay? And how close you get it to conception, everybody's on disagreement. But it's there definitely before birth. Uh, and uh, Tranducianism, Tranducianism uh, is the teaching that the soul as well as the body uh, are inherited through our parents. Okay? So uh, in one way, the, the body is inherited through our parents and God gives us each a new soul at the moment of conception or before birth and in the other one the soul also comes through inheritance. So those are the two different views that are out there. And that has a lot of raises a lot of questions about uh, about abortion. Uh, when are we a real person? When does God do it? And uh, uh, do in fact one main question from this is uh, do, does God, in fact, give a soul to an aborted baby? So that, uh, uh, interesting questions that we come out of it. All right, so let, let's go to the next part. So what we're going to do is we're going to change our diagram now so that uh, uh, <clears throat> it reflects the different parts of the inner man. So that you have the outer self, which is the physical parts, and the inner self, which is made up of five parts, the nature, the spirit, the flesh, the mind, and the will. And I've specifically drawn them this way, so you have the three circles, they're intersecting, because the nature, the spirit, and the flesh, they all intersect, they all affect each other, and, and, and what, how the, the desires would go. And one of the main things you need to think of is that nature has to do with wanting a relationship with God. Spirit and flesh have to do with desires, so the desires of the spirit are desiring the things of God, Loving the things that God loves, wanting righteousness, wanting to be obedient, uh, all those kinds of things. And the desires of the flesh are those things that desire uh, the, 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 uh, the sin. Uh, this is where the heart of temptation is. It's, it's uh, the things that where, where we build the idols of our heart. Okay? And then the mind is where all of those things filter through. And within the mind we, we have things like the, the knowledge, our skills, um, our conscience, um, all those different things in there, we'll get to that too. And they filter those things, so the desire, one major strong desire comes into the mind, the mind decides whether it's going to act on it or not. And if it says, okay, I will act, now the will is free to make it a choice to, to, to choose to act upon it. And that turns into action. And we'll get into that process in more detail. All right, I, I'm, I'm not anywhere where I was hoping to be, but that's okay. All right, so um, okay. Well, let me. Um, we may have to do this over three weeks. Any questions so far? I love this course. Let me let me give you something else here that is really important at this point, because um, especially when it comes to eschatology, we have a whole bunch of different words that we use in terms of eschatology that relate to this outer man, inner man part, and uh, that's the words uh, literal, metaphorical, physical, and spiritual. Okay, though those are important words in terms of eschatology, but dispensationalists want us to believe that literal and spiritual are opposites. Because what they say is we have to take the Old Testament literally. So where it talks about the nation of Israel, then that means the nation of Israel. So if it says Israel is going to have a renewed temple, then that must literally mean that sometime in the future, God's got to rebuild the temple. 
It hasn't happened yet, so it's still future. It's literal. And if you say, no, that's, that's metaphorical, that the spirit is, the temple is referring, that Israel is referring to the body of Christ, and the church is metaphorical, the, the temple is metaphorical for the body of Christ. If you say that, then the dispensationalist says well, you're spiritualizing. Because spiritualizing is opposite of literal. But that's not true. Um, literal is definitely the straightforward sense of a text. And that's really important. We need to understand the literal straightforwardness of the text. Um, but then the word and, and spiritual is just as, as our inner part is a spiritual part. Um, it's non-physical, and so then the spiritual part um, is non-physical objects or concepts all pertaining to the spiritual domain. So, and, but spiritual is not the same as metaphorical, even though a metaphor contains, can contain spiritual elements. I'll just explain that in a minute. So the word literal, literal, again, the normal straightforward sense of a text, but metaphorical is then when you take those literal things, the characters, events, those objects, and they're, they're taken literally, but you represent them as they represent something else or a point of another meaning, have another meaning. Then it's metaphorical. So physical then uh, means something tangible. It's made of matter. And physical is not the same as literal. For example, uh, you can have symbols, parables, allegories. All of these things are physical objects. Uh, likewise, uh, s s this, the things of the spirit are literal, do literally exist, but they're not physical. Right? So uh, the opposite of literal is metaphorical. The opposite of physical is spiritual. So it's really important you have that straight in your mind. And so we even have this, so in the inner man, outer man, the physical, the opposite of it is the spiritual. We're, we're not literal and, and, and uh, we, well, we can be literal and physical, so I can literally see you and you're physical, but uh, you can also be literal and spiritual. So God literally exists, but he's spiritual. Angels literally exist, but they're spiritual. Um, you can be physical and metaphorical. So Hera, uh, ha uh, Hagar rather, remember in Galatians 4? Hagar represents what? She's a metaphor for the Old Covenant, right? And Sarah is a metaphor for the New Covenant. So they're physical, but they're not referring to them in their li literally as Harry, Hagar, and Sarah, but they're using, being used metaphorically. That's the same with uh, Revelation chapter 20 when it talks about uh, the key, the chain, and the abyss. Right? It's, it's not a literal abyss. It's not a literal chain. It's not a literal key. But those are physical items, but they're used, being used metaphorically. And the same with the beast of Revelation 13. Um, or a, a more modern example, Pilgrim in Pilgrim's Progress. He's a, he's a literal person, but he doesn't really exist. He's metaphor of the Christian's life and so forth. You can also be spiritual and metaphorical. Um, so like the screw tape, the screw tape letters. He, he's, he's, uh, he's spiritual and metaphorical. But you cannot be literal and spiritual. You cannot be... Um, uh, you mean literal and metaphorical? Spiritual and metaphorical. Right. <coughs> What's that? You mean physical and spiritual? Right. You, yeah. You said literal and spiritual, but you already said you that. You cannot be literal and metaphorical, and you cannot be physical and spiritual. Yeah, so uh, to get that straight. That's just something that comes out of it. All right, so I'm going to have to end there. Unless... Uh... Let me just go a little bit further here. I'll wrap this next part up in, in, in five minutes. So, so we have an outer man and we have an inner man. The outer man is physical and material. The inner man is spiritual and immaterial. And that spiritual immaterial part is, is called the soul and it's made up of the nature, the spirit, the flesh, the mind, and the will. So a verse that goes with that, Colossians 3, 9 and 10. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self, with its practices 
and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So now what it's telling us is that there's actually a difference between being a believer and a non-believer. And so being a non-believer, that inner man is called the old self, and in the when you are become a believer, that inner man is now called the new self. So something drastically happens uh, within the inner man at the moment of our conversion. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. And uh, the, the old has passed away, behold, the new has come. So again, that's referring directly to this prophecy of, of Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah <coughs> under the new covenant, where we are going to be given a new nature. The old nature will be removed, the new nature will be put in. Okay, and that's a physical thing that God actually does at the moment of our regeneration. And, and it's a new creation, making us a new creation. Uh, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. Put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So there you see that word desires? Desires of the spirit, desires of the flesh. What we're going to discover is that in the old man, the, the spirit is dead, the, so the desires are only the desires of the flesh. Um, verse 23, but be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. All right, so um, what we're going to do next, and we'll do this next time, is I want us to go into, we're going to go into detail of the the, the old man and Adam, which is, so this is the, the picture of the old man and Adam, and this is the picture of in Christ. So you can see right off that there, there's, there's some obvious changes that, that have occurred between the, between the two things. So that in Adam we have a depraved nature, a dead spirit, and a living flesh, and then in Christ we have a regenerated <coughs> nature, a living spirit, and look at the flesh. It's still black. It's still living. So the, f the <coughs> same flesh that was living there in Adam is still living in us in Christ. That hasn't, hasn't been corrected yet. Okay? And so what we're going to discover is that uh, the, the Spirit, notice here that we have, it kind of creates a line here. There's a line up here. So if we talk about strength and weaknesses, uh, the living Spirit is, is weak. It's alive. But it needs to be, become stronger. The flesh is strong still, but it's becoming weaker. So it's not full anymore. In, in, in Adam, it's completely, it's, it's completely full. Okay, but in, uh, uh, over here, it's getting, it's getting weaker. And that, so what, what, would you, what do you su suspect will happen then at the day of resurrection when we're given new bodies? Yeah. Yeah, the spirit, or the, the flesh is going to be totally dead, and the spirit's going to be still, totally strong. So does that mean we go into eternity with, still with the flesh? Will we have, will we, is there a chance that in eternity we could sin again? <laughs> That's the answer, but it, it creates that question from this, doesn't it? Okay, and, and we're going to actually discover why, why, that, uh, why that is. Um, all right, so we're going to end there, and, um, and we'll, um, we'll pick it up at that spot. So I'm going to check this off here.